In the early days of science fiction movies and TV shows, aliens always looked extremely human. This decision wasn't made because it seemed like the most probable reality, but because the aliens needed to be portrayed by humans in makeup or costumes. However, while CGI has made it possible to create any type of alien creatures we want, they continue to be depicted as predominantly humanoid. This is partly because of convention. It's always been that way, so it's going to remain that way because it's what people expect. It's also because of the less human these characters become, it's harder for a human audience to relate to them. Now, that's fine if the aliens in question are supposed to be one-dimensional villains, but that's usually not the case. Of course, as we continue to peer deeper into space and the odds of finding alien life theoretically increase, it raises the question of whether or not these depictions are realistic or purely human-centric fantasy. So is there any scientific basis by which we could claim that a technologically intelligent alien race would actually look like us? Our current sample size of technologically intelligent species is only one, but let's use that singular sample and our experiences here on Earth to wildly speculate about the answer anyway. Now, in order to understand how alien life might evolve, we need to first understand how evolution and the idea of convergent evolution works. To start, evolution begins completely randomly, at least in a manner of speaking. Organisms experience arbitrary mutations in their DNA that occur every generation. These mutations may prove to be beneficial or detrimental, and it is the process of natural selection that is the driving force behind evolution. All organisms are competing for resources, and mutations that provide a competitive advantage will allow that individual to thrive and pass their DNA down to future generations. However, evolution doesn't have an end goal. When abiogenesis occurs on a planet, creating the first single-celled organisms, evolution doesn't then try to speedrun its way toward intelligent life. We can't even assume that technologically intelligent life is an inevitability on every planet that evolves complex life forms. It's also important to remember that this process doesn't try to find the best solution, it just finds whatever works. As long as a mutation results in the organism being competitive enough to survive, it will continue to reproduce and pass on that mutation. And as long as things are going fine, there isn't a reason to change it. One of the most common examples of this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the nerve connecting your brain and your larynx. These two organs are located really close to one another, so it would make sense to have a short, direct connection between them. Instead, the nerve connecting them travels downward and wraps around the heart before returning. This is a relic of our time as fish, when the path was more direct, but evolution hasn't done anything to fix this bizarre, circuitous connection. And that's because there's no need to. It's an idiotic design, but it's also not a problem, so many mutations that might address this nerve don't provide a competitive advantage. Of course, over time, natural selection can often lead to optimal solutions. But that isn't the goal. The goal of evolution is to create organisms that can survive and reproduce produce, and if something is good enough, then it's likely to stick around unless there's a real need to change it. But sometimes there are solutions that are just plain good. And that brings us back to the idea of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when two or more unrelated species develop the same trait independently of one another. Oftentimes, the closest shared ancestor of these creatures would be hundreds of millions of years in the past and not resemble either of the new species in any way, making a common genetic link to the developed trait impossible. Instead, these traits develop independently as a solution to a specific problem being posed. One of the most obvious examples of convergent evolution is the eye. We take for granted that most animals need eyes to see, but those eyes had to come from somewhere. As life evolved from single cells to increasingly complex forms of life, sensory perception became important for navigating the world. Bacteria rely on something similar to a sense of touch, but increased complexity of life allowed for an increased amount of sensory input. And since Earth's environment is filled with light, the development of photosensitive cells that could perceive this light and thus view the world at a distance it was a pretty good solution. Indeed, it was such a good solution that eyes have evolved at least 40 different times on Earth, completely unrelated from one another. There are variations of exactly how they function, but their ubiquity 
is no accident. Well, it's an accident in the sense that the mutations that led to eyes being developed were haphazard and random, but there's no debate that the development of eyes and a sense of sight would provide a massive competitive advantage. Another popular example of convergent evolution are sharks, dolphins, and whales. Sharks are the largest fish in the world, while dolphins and whales are mammals. Sharks evolved about 450 million years ago, and they had reached the epitome of competitive advantage. The position of their fins, the shape of their tail, and even the texture of their skin were perfectly designed to make them among the fastest swimmers in the ocean. Fast forward 400 years to a small deer-like creature about the size of a house cat. This land mammal is the last common ancestor of dolphins and whales before its lineage split in two and both sides crawled back into the ocean. Despite being separated from sharks by hundreds of millions of years, both of these species developed bodies that were shaped extremely similarly, including the number and location of their fins. Then there is the bane of campers everywhere who just wanted five more minutes of sleep, the woodpecker. Woodpeckers are unable to fly across oceans, but they exist on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. These different species of birds evolved independently of one another to have a very particular set of skills. Trees are full of delicious but difficult to access grubs, so woodpeckers would tap the tree bark to find a space that sounded hollow. This hollow sound would indicate the presence of a cavity where the grub was feasting on the woods, and the birds could then use use their hard beaks to break through the bark and insert their absurdly long barbed tongues into the holes to retrieve their meal. It's not just woodpeckers either. There are plenty of other drilling birds that use specialized beaks to bore down into wood so they can hunt down their next meal. However, this is also where things get a bit complicated. We could be here all day listing examples of convergence evolution, such as flight evolving four times, trees evolving to exploit ant labor a dozen times, or how crustaceans simply refuse to stop evolving into bloody crabs. But with the apparent exception of crabs, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way. Eyes evolved so many different times because they seem to be the only possible solution for the task at hand. But sometimes a problem can have more than one solution. Trees may be full of delicious grubs, but drilling birds aren't the only creatures created by evolution to feast on them. Woodpeckers have never evolved on the island of Madagascar because they instead have the eye eye. Now, most people think of lemurs as being pretty cute, but the eye eye are just pure nightmare fuel. This species of lemur performs a similar task as woodpeckers. But instead of using a beak, it uses its extremely long middle finger. The eye eye can tap against the wood with the finger to find hollow spots where the grubs live, bite through the bark with its sharp teeth, and then insert the long finger that also sports omnidirectional rotation to pull out the insects to feast upon them. Although the eye eye is performing the same basic task as those birds, it has evolved to solve this problem in a different way. And even though the evolution of drilling birds was much more common, it doesn't mean that one solution is more valid or more inevitable than the other. So while convergence evolution Evolution is a well-established fact of life here on Earth, it does not mean that life on alien planets would have to converge on the same unavoidable traits of various animals that we know today. But that doesn't mean that we can't still speculate on what qualities are most likely to appear in technologically intelligent alien species. With all of that out of the way, what can we expect when it comes to alien life? Assuming that the life is made up of matter rather than being some energy-based life form that we can't even imagine, it stands to reason that technologically intelligent life will only come in the form of terrestrial animals. Our atmosphere here is full of bacteria, but those are all microbes that originated in the water or on the ground before getting launched into the air by various weather conditions. Now, to the best of our knowledge, no life has ever evolved to live exclusively in the atmosphere. That doesn't mean it's impossible that such a thing could happen, but it has failed to happen throughout the billions of years of life on Earth. This means that even if such a planet were in its star's habitable zone, we can likely rule out gas planets as a source of intelligent life. We can also likely rule out any planets entirely covered in water and any aquatic species as being a source of technological intelligence as well. There are a couple of major reasons for this. The first being that, as any singing crustacean will tell you, life is much better under the sea. Or, at the very least, it's a whole lot easier. Evolution is already a slow process process, requiring generation after generation of mutations before new traits emerge. But for aquatic life, there seems to be much less of a need for evolution. Oceans have relatively constant temperatures and stable environments, eliminating a lot of the environmental pressures that result in evolution. Once nature has selected a trait as being good enough for a particular organism to thrive, it takes a longer time for changes in the ecosystem to reinvigorate the search for a competitive advantage. Of course, this assumption may be based on researching bias because terrestrial creatures 
dinosaurs and fossils are easier for humans to study, resulting in large unknown gaps in our understanding of underwater evolution. But regardless of whether or not that assertion is correct, there's a much bigger problem for aquatic life developing technology. For those living underwater, it is impossible to harness the powers of either fire or electricity. These are seen as crucial elements of technological advancement, forcing intelligence to live on land. And if they're forced to be land animals, that brings us one step closer to them being humanoid. There are a few more broad generalizations that we can make about these beings as well. With the exception of sponges, all animals on Earth are symmetrical. Usually, this comes in the form of bilateral symmetry, though there is also radial symmetry in things like starfish and jellyfish. But as bilateral symmetry is nearly universal among terrestrial animals, we can assume this to be the most likely case for our alien friends as well. Another safe assumption is that their sensory organs will be concentrated on one end of their body, close to the brain. Ideally, this would be located at the tallest point on the animal, as that would allow it to perceive the furthest distance. This is what you might refer to as your head. The idea that aliens would have heads may seem really obvious, but we don't want to make assumptions if they can't be deducted logically. Since we mentioned sensory organs, what kind of organs would they have? The only one that seems certain is that they would have eyes. Any habitable planet needs to be near enough to a star that it should be illuminated, thus creating the same environmental conditions necessary for eyes to evolve. Their eyes could look very different than human eyes, and they may see a different spectrum of light depending on the brightness of their star and composition of their atmosphere, but it's a pretty safe bet that intelligent aliens would have eyes, specifically two eyes. Having a single eye would deprive the organism of depth perception, but having more than two eyes would be too inefficient. About 20% of your metabolic energy is used to power your brain, and a huge percentage of that goes to processing sensory input. While increasing the number of eyes beyond two could create a competitive advantage, it would be outweighed by the increase in energy consumption and thus the need to consume more fuel. This is a reason why perpetually increasing intelligence and brain size isn't a convergent trait among animals. The need to consume extra resources in order to fuel a more powerful brain is actually a competitive disadvantage for most species. But going back to sensory organs, eyes are the only ones that seem to be really inevitable. While ears are a common trait among animals and have evolved at least six times on Earth, evolution has found other options as well. Some animals use antenna or other organs to sense vibrations and changes in air pressure as a substitute to the way we perceive sound. Antenna can also detect chemical signals and pheromones as a replacement for the way we perceive smell, so neither ears nor noses are a guarantee on intelligent aliens. They would, however, need a mouth to consume food and a way to expel waste. Ideally, this would require two different holes, but that isn't mandatory in the animal kingdom. One of the most important traits that we can assume our alien friends will feature is a way to hold tools and manipulate objects using fine motor skills. To us, this means hands with opposable thumbs, but we don't really have other data points on this one. Intelligent aliens would certainly require appendages with some form of digits that are both rigid and and flexible enough to perform delicate actions involving tools, regardless of whether or not they look like human hands. This all sounds pretty humanoid so far, but there are a couple of areas where we could see big changes. One of those is in height. How large a terrestrial animal can be is pretty dependent on the gravity of that planet. On a planet with lower gravity to Earth, aliens could grow to be much taller, as their organs wouldn't need to work nearly as hard to circulate blood or some blood-like analog through their bodies. They would also require less energy to move their larger bodies. An Earth-like planet with lower gravity could result in tall, lanky bodies. On the flip side, if the planet was larger than Earth and thus had stronger gravity, the aliens could be much shorter, though not necessarily less massive. These aliens would likely require thick skeletons and immense muscle mass in order to survive and move around on their planet, and they may not possess the ability to walk upright for any extended period. The energy consumption needed to fuel such a body would be increased, making the development of technological intelligence less likely, but not impossible. As for the other potential big change, that's the number of limbs these aliens might have. It's easy for us to think that four limbs is the correct number for larger animals to have because every terrestrial vertebrate on Earth has four limbs, but that isn't actually an example of convergent evolution, it's just an accident. Vertebrates didn't independently converge on the trait of four legs, we simply all share a singular commonality ancestor, a fish that had four fins. Those fins evolved into legs, and that was that. But if we take into account all land animals, rather than just vertebrates, the most common number of legs is six. 
There are a lot of advantages to having six legs over four, especially when it comes to traversing a wide variety of terrain. It also is superior for balance, as locomotion, where three legs are on the ground in a tripod stance, is more stable than just two alternating legs. The drawback to six legs over four is the increase in energy consumption, and we've already touched upon how there is a delicate balance between increased energy consumption and added utility when it comes to determining if an evolutionary trait is an advantage or a disadvantage. So, which is better, and thus more likely for our age? Six legs or four? In all likelihood, there isn't actually an answer. They've both proven to be perfectly successful solutions to the problem of terrestrial locomotion, and we haven't seen animals evolve to grow or remove legs to converge on either number. So, alien centaurs aren't definitely still on the table. We also can't say for certain whether the limbs that are used to manipulate tools would be used for locomotion. It stands to reason that they probably wouldn't be, but this is again based on our sample size of one. Humans are the only mammals on Earth that predominantly walk bipedally. Plenty of other mammals are capable of walking on two legs, but none of them do it as a general rule. Even kangaroos, iconic for hopping around on their hind legs, usually walk on all fours. There are a lot of disadvantages to walking on only two legs, but the biggest advantages are that it is more energy efficient and it frees up the hands to use as tools. Being as efficient as possible with energy consumption would be ideal for developing technological intelligence as these aliens would need that energy to power their brains. Now we keep mentioning the brain's energy consumption and have said that 20% of humans' metabolic energy goes into fueling the brain. But as another basis of comparison, our brains require twice as much metabolic energy as a chimpanzee's brain despite them being our closest living relatives. Anyway, the final thing that our technologically intelligent aliens will need is a way to communicate complex ideas. Being smart as individuals doesn't really matter. Without the ability to communicate that knowledge to your offspring, allowing future generations to build upon and expand the existing well of information available. For humans, that means a descended larynx. But other animals communicate using only touch, facial expressions, and gestures. While no other animals have developed a form of communication nearly as complex as humans, with so many different methods in use across the planet that we can't assume the aliens will converge on speech by default. But even if they do use speech, their head may still be designed differently than ours. The fact that we eat, breathe, and speak using the same hole isn't a great design. Even if the existence of a larynx necessitated breathing and speaking through the same orifice, it's not outrageous to conceive of an alien that had a separate one for food consumption. So it's important to remember that a key element of convergent evolution is the existence of the same environmental pressures. While technologically intelligent life on a planet exactly like Earth may evolve into something nearly identical to humans, the more the environment of that planet differs from ours, then the more life on that planet may diverge from what we're familiar with. Still, based on what we know about convergent evolution and what is necessary for a creature to develop technology, there are a number of at least superficial ways that we can expect intelligent aliens to resemble us. It's reasonable to assume that intelligent alien life would be bilaterally symmetrical with a head on top containing its sensory organs, including exactly two eyes. It would also be a land-based animal with either four or six limbs, two of which were used exclusively for manipulating tools and their environment rather than for locomotion, and which had dexterous digits somewhat akin to fingers. That's essentially humanoid, possibly with an extra pair of legs, but there are still other ways that they could differ significantly. There could be antennas instead of ears or a nose, separate orifices for breathing and eating, and they could have wildly different anatomy that enabled forms of communication that we can't really imagine. Aside from needing heads and hands or something similar with digits, the rest of the aliens' bodies could theoretically be pretty much anything. However, there is one way in which these aliens would almost certainly be like us. We've talked a lot about energy efficiency as it pertains to evolution and about how much energy a brain like ours needs to operate. While the long-held belief that eating meat is what made us human has recently been called into question and maybe more of a it's complicated situation, it doesn't change the fact that early humans did eat meat. Plants aren't nearly as nutrient or calorie dense as meat, so hunting other animals was a more efficient way to fuel our bodies. It stands to reason that this would be the case on an alien planet as well. So any technologically intelligent aliens most likely would, by necessity, have originated as predators just like humans. This means they could have the same innate predatory instincts that we have. So, if we ever meet them, let's just hope that we're the more advanced species, alright?